Welcome to Australian Hiker, your online hiking resource. We're your hosts, Tim and Jill Savage. This is episode 149 of the Australian Hiker podcast. In today's episode, we discuss the Japanese Kamano Kodo Pilgrimage Trail. This trail, which was included on the World Heritage List in 2004, is a network of several ancient pilgrimage routes that converge on the Kamano Hongu Tashi Shrine in the mountainous heart of Wakayama Prefecture in Japan. I've heard a lot about this trail over the years and read a lot of different articles in various hiking and outdoor magazines, so I was keen to find out more about what it has on offer. In today's episode, we provide you with a series of three interviews uh, to provide different perspectives on this amazing trail. We hope you enjoy. In our first interview, we're going to catch up with Marcus Ludricks from Home Comforts Hiking. Home Comforts Hiking is an Australian-based company which offers what can be best described as glamping experiences. Their hikes provide you with a shower, a meal and a bed at the end of each day, so you only need to carry a day pack and don't need to be a super hiker to complete the walks. Marcus leads many of the escorted hikers, but his company also offers self-guided options for those that want a bit more independence. In today's episode, Marcus will help set the scene by providing an overview of the Kamano Kodo Trail, as well as discussing the services that he he and his company offers. Marcus, thanks for taking the time to talk with Australian Hiker. Thanks, Tim. It's uh, great to be with you, and uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about this amazing area. Okay, so before we talk about the walk itself, tell us a bit about your hiking history, your, your background. Okay, so... Going back a long while, so um, we've got five kids. So when the kids were young, you know, as a form of entertainment, we used to do local walks. We live in a beautiful area here on the mid-north coast, so there's plenty plenty of beautiful walks around here, but they were all day walks. The first multi-day walk I did was probably about 15 years ago, and it was the Rootburn Trail in New Zealand, and I just absolutely loved it. The best holiday I ever had you know, up until that date. I just love being in the bush and that, uh, and you know, just going from day to day, it was just uh, fantastic. So I looked for more and uh, did did some in, um, of course, in Australia, Tasmania, you know, the Overland and um, and um, Three Capes. So got the, did some in Nepal and India, Vietnam, and, uh, and then, of course, Japan. So... Yeah, that's pretty much, yeah, just really love love hiking. So that's what got me into it. All right. And what, and, and when you're not leading hikes, what's the what sort of hikes do you do for pleasure now? Yeah, so often my wife and I will just um, go and do a local hike. Um, so we, we love the Port Macquarie Coastal Walk. It's absolutely stunning and Quite often that's a that's an easy go to because it's about nine kilometres, so it's about two or three hours, you know, and uh, just beautiful along the coast. When the when it's whale season, you can see whales. So it's uh, and often often we see dolphins as well, and it's just a beautiful part of the world. So so that's one, and then there's plenty of others in this local area. So they they they're the main ones, the, mainly around this local area. Okay, so let's talk about the trail itself. Now, correct me if I've got my pronunciation horribly wrong. So we're looking at the Kamano Kodo Trail. Is that the right way way to pronounce it? Kamano Kodo. Okay, now tell us a bit about uh, this this trail or this trail system. Sure. So the Kamano Kodo is actually a a sister walk of the uh, Camino de Santiago in Spain. And they're the only two, as far as I'm aware, they're the only two pilgrimage trails in the world. Um, and similar to the uh, Camino de Santiago, the Camino Kodo has a number of trails that lead into the one central point, which is at uh, Hongu. So you can walk many different trails, but there is definitely a most popular trail because 
because of um, the um, the situation with accommodation and um, scenery and so forth, the Nakahechi Trail is the most popular of the uh, of the trails. Okay, and what sort of distance is that one? And the Nakahechi is thirty eight kilometres, and it starts at um, Takajiri. It's called. It's a forty minute bus ride from Kitana Bay. Now, Kitana Bay is a two-hour train ride from Osaka Kicks Airport, KIX Airport, and um, it's it's a great little little town. So that's uh, usually where we start. We have our first night there, and uh, have our briefings there, and then we um, have a nice meal. There's there's about seventy or eighty restaurants there in the, in the in the town. It's a very small town, but it's a great little town. Uh, then uh, the next morning you take a 40-minute bus ride to Takajiri, and that's where the trailhead is. And then from there it's 38 kilometres to um, Hongu, but you can, you don't walk the whole 38 kilometres in one day, of course. No, no. So I, sp- I suppose on that basis, I mean, you're saying that's the most popular trail. What, what other options are there? So if people say, yeah. look, I want to do something a bit different, because I'm guessing the one you're talking about if it's the most popular, there's probably more people there that you're going to come across. Um, yeah, yeah, there is, but there's not a there's not huge amounts. So I have walked quite a uh, quite often on the Nakahechi, where we've been the only people that we've seen all day on the trail. So the villages and the um, the shrines they're they're more popular, of course, the shrines especially, but they have tend to get a lot of bus tours. So the buses drive straight to the shrine. Yep. And as soon as you walk 200 metres from the shrine, that's it. You don't see anyone anymore. Okay, so <laughs> so the majority of the tourists are, are definitely doing it in, you know, with minimal effort. Uh, and, and, yeah. But in this case here with doing the trail, you're walking from shrine to shrine and, and reaching the end point. Correct, yeah. So, um, the yeah, the, a, a lot of the tourists are um, Japanese. So a lot of Japanese tourists come to this area because of because of its significance um, as a um, you know a religious area in in Japan. So you, you you did ask me about the other trails. So there's the the Nakahechi. Now when we walk the Nakahechi, that takes us to Hongu. Now we continue walking on to the uh, to the east coast, which is um, Kikatsura. And we take another couple of trails there. We take the uh, Kogumatori Goe and the Ogamatori Goe. So, um, and then there's another little little hike we do when we're around Hongu called the Da Inichi Goe. So there's there's um, lots of uh, trails there, but there's also uh, other trails. So there's the Kohechi, the ma- mountainous route, which is about 70 kilometres, which starts at uh, Koyasan. Now, Koya Sun is an absolutely um, stunning um, village with lots and lots of history, and it's a it's a beautiful route, but it is much much tougher. Yeah. So I tend to um, organise that one as self guided rather than uh, leading groups on that one. There's a coastal route Ohechi, uh, which goes along the south coast from Tarnabo. Uh, there's another eastern coastal route. Which is the Izzy G, and then the uh, another mountainous route, which is the Omine Okuga Kemichi Trail. So, as you can see, uh, like um, the Camino de Santiago, there are uh, lots of options. But for most walkers, I'd say ninety-five percent of walkers, the Nakahechi is the way to go. Okay, is that also known as the Imperial Trail, or am I thinking of it's- another one? Yeah, the Imperial Route. That's right. Okay. Now, how, how did these trails come about? I mean, was it just a religious pilgrimage, uh, uh, where, which is where it came from, or would it come about for some other reason? Yeah, so I'll tell you a bit about the history. Um, so it's it's Kimono is the ancient name uh, of the southern region of the Key Peninsula. So this this uh, all these trails are in an area called the Key Peninsula. Uh, which is south of uh, Osaka and Kyoto and um, um, Kobe, I think, as well. Um, so for centuries, um, the nature in this area has been deified. The mountains, the streams, the waterfalls, the trees, the rocks, they all have significance 
in the Shinto and Buddhist religion of the area. Yep. So um, it's also believed to be the otherworldly um, abode of, of the gods, you know. So that's uh, it's it's been the focus of pilgrimages for well over a thousand years and there's been some form of um, shrine at Hong Kong for over 2,000 years. So you can see I'm wearing a T-shirt with t- 2,050 on it yeah. and this... This was to celebrate the 2050th anniversary of Hongu Grand Shrine, uh, which is quite unbelievable. So it was actually before Christ. Um, so the the Kimono Hongu Teisha, which is that Grand Shrine, which is all roads lead to this Grand Shrine, it's uh, on the Kimono Gawa River. Now, over the over the centuries, many times it was washed away by floods or, or you know, um, burnt uh, uh, by fire, so they'd have to rebuild it and rebuild it. So they, they continually have rebuilt it when it has uh, washed away or burnt. Um, so, yeah, so the, the... And this shrine is one of three grand shrines in the area. So there's the Kimono uh, Hongu Teisha, there's a Kimono... Hayatama Tisha, which is, as I said, the Hongu ones on the river. Hayatama is on the Pacific Ocean, but at, at the end of the Kamonogawa uh, River. And then there's the Nachi, Nachi Shrine, Nachi Sun, uh, which is on Nachi Waterfall, which is the tallest waterfall in Japan. Uh, it's about, I don't know, 150 metres. So I would have, you know, it's not hugely tall, but it is the tallest waterfall in Japan. I must, um, admit, I must admit, and I don't know why, but I, did, I just don't associate Japan with waterfalls. No, no. Well, um, yeah, so it's it's ac- absolutely stunning there at Nachi Sun, and that is uh, one of the one of the things that we include in all our tours is um, that we visit all three shrines, and um, yeah, that's uh, uh, and all three collectively they're called the Kumono Sunzen. Um, yeah. All right, so, so I was going to yeah. say, so really with this, being a pilgrimage trail, I'm there's a number of reasons I understand why, why people do it. So one the, one of the obvious ones which you've been talking about is the shrines themselves. Yeah. So tell us, you know, without, without getting too carried away, tell us a bit more about the shrines that you, people are visiting. What are, they, what are they seeing and sort of how much time do you tend to spend at each shrine? Okay, so there's, um, yeah, like, as far as uh, our groups are concerned, we spend roughly only an hour or two at the most at each shrine. Um, the, the tours are more about the hiking, but we do spend time to explore the shrines. Um, what do people do at the shrines? Well, they worship, of course. They meditate. Um, and there is a, a little ritual um, where you ring the bell, um, clap three times, bow, say a prayer, meditate, and then uh, bow and 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 retreat. So, uh, oh, and of course, put coins in the coin slot. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, but yeah, originally, originally it was um, mainly emperors and the upper class that did these pilgrimages. But um, as time has gone on, more and more people are uh, the common common Japanese um, people are also doing these pilgrimages. But as I said, most of them do them by car. So. I, okay, so we've got the shrines. And, you know, I, I, uh, what I'll try and do is uh, I'll put some images of some of these shrines in the uh, the show notes for this podcast just to give yep. people an indication. Sure. Um, we've also got the landscape. And, you've, you know, you've talked about the waterfalls and, and yeah. you know, I've, I've seen pictures of Japanese landscapes and, you know, it does certainly look stunning. So tell us a bit about the landscape of the, the area that you're walking through typically. Sure. Um, it's mountainous, but there's um, – on the Key Peninsula, there's nothing over a 1,000 metres. So, you know, our toughest toughest walks usually would have around a 1,000 metres of ascent in a day. Um, if you're doing the – Kohechi Trail. It's a little bit tougher and a bit steeper, but most of most of our walking is, you know, roughly between the sort of three hundred and eight hundred meters per day of ascent. Um, it's mainly forests. There are some uh, timber plantations because they grow a lot of um, 
uh, lumber for for um, you know for building. Yep. Uh, and but it's interspersed with these gorgeous little villages. Um, the trees they're mainly uh, Japanese cypress and Japanese cedar, and some of them are just huge. They must be centuries old. You know, they're absolutely um, stunning specimens. Um, cherry blossoms in spring, so that's always a highlight. So that's why April's always a popular time to go. Yep. Um, that's when when the um, peak of the cherry blossom season is. And the other other highlight is the rivers. They're they're crystal clear, aqua blue, you know. So and along the route, there's numerous ogies, which are an oji, O J I, is a subsidiary shrine to the three main shrines of the Kumana Sunzen. Are these the, are they a, a building, or are they more just a little little um, almost a miniature shrine on the side of the trail? Yeah, so a bit of both. So they can range in size from just the size of a small box to to an actual, you know, building, which is yeah, similar size to a house, you know. So they, they they vary, and there's there's lots of them. And one of the nice things with the Kamano Kodo is when you start the trail, you get a stamp book, and at each uh, of these OGs and at the main shrines, of course, you can collect stamps. So that's quite a... A fun thing for for people to do along the hike. Now you mentioned it was a sister trail to the Camino, and I believe there is a certificate you can get once you've walked both trails. Correct. Yeah. So um, so if you come along on the Camino Cordo and you have w- walked the Camino de Santiago, then you just need some sort of evidence that you've walked the Camino de Santiago, and that may be as simple as a photo of you receiving your certificate in uh, Santiago de Compostela. Uh, if you show that photo and show your stamp book for the Kamono Kodo, you'll receive the certificate. And uh, I've had a couple of um, a couple of people that have been in my group that have collected the the dual dual um, pilgrim certificate. I think we I think we've actually got um, we're talking to a couple of hikers after we've uh, talked to you, and I think both of them have done that where they've they've walked both the Camino and and this trail as well. So talk about the distances um, that are travelled each day. So we're we doing the Imperial Route, I'll, and I'll stick with that name, otherwise I'm going to butcher the, the correct pronunciation. So sure. um, what's the average distance per day that people are travelling? Okay, so um, day one's 13 kilometres. That's from Takajiri to um, Chikatsuyu, and it's, it's a tough start. It's about four or five hundred metres of ascent in the first couple of kilometres. But after that, it's pretty good going. Um, Day two is a little bit shorter. It's closer to 10 kilometres. We don't walk the whole 38 kilometres. And the reason for that is because it's quite tough the second day. If you do the whole lot, you have to do 25 kilometres on the second day. Yeah. I, I've just I, when I was uh, doing the recce, my wife and I uh, did do that, and we found it way too tough, you know. Um, so we so what I do there is I actually pick out the highlights, and then we um, uh, jump on a bus to Hongu. Then day three, we walk from Hongu area to Koguchi, which, and that, that's on the uh, Kogumotori Goe. So that's, um, that's about 14 kilometres. It's, it's the day with the beautiful mountain views. Okay. Right. Um, and then day, day four, there is two options. So, um, so it usually depends on the group. Um, we can either take a jet boat ride on the river and then go and explore Shingu, which is where the uh, Grand Shrine Hayatama is, or we can walk over the mountain, which but it's a 1,000-metre ascent that day, <laughs> uh, to Nachisan, to the waterfall. So either way, we see Nachisan. If we don't walk to Nachisan, then the next day we take the bus there. If we do walk to Nachisan, then the next day we take the bus to Hayatama. 
by the sound of it, you know, we there's not they're not huge distances, and you know, and and, and there are some good good ascents. So how yeah. how fit uh, do you need to be, and how much experience do you need as a hiker to do this yeah. walk? Yeah, sure. So um, a lot of people ask me, is the hiking difficult? And I say, well, for some people, yes, it is, you know. So if you do very little physical activity or you carry an injury or you have health issues, then sure, it's going to be uh, too difficult, I think, and I, I recommend they don't join. Um, but a, a really good test is to find a bush track in the local area that climbs to about 500 metres and over five kilometres, see if you can do five kilometres in three hours. And if you can do that, you can easily do the Kamonokoro. Um, but overall, I'd rate the hike moderate. Um, there are some steep and hilly sections, a couple of um, steep ascents. But then usually once you've done them, you get some easier walking. And the, the, the tracks themselves are, are generally quite good. But once again, there are some little bits where there's tree roots and, you know, rocky bits. So it's not it's not like a footpath. Okay. Do you recommend yeah. do you recommend that people take um, hiking poles with them for this trip? Yes. I actually, I actually provide a packing list to all the guests before we leave. So, um, yeah, that's all in, uh, included in that list. So all the all the recommended gear to bring and so forth. Now, what uh, what sort of hikers tend to be attracted to doing this trail? Um, seem to be um, more like uh, baby boomers, so my generation. I do get I do get a lot of customers from Hong Kong, so that's a little bit of a side story here because I'm our son lives in Hong Kong, so I was I was going there quite regularly. I haven't been for a few months because of coronavirus. Um, but yeah, our son, so I started hiking in Hong Kong and the hiking in Hong Kong is unbelievable. <laughs> I was really very surprised. Anyway, one thing led to another and I ended up joining the local Hong Kong hiking meetup, which has 24,000 members <laughs> and they actually have a leader program. So I, I've actually done their leader program and when I'm in Hong Kong, I lead hikes there. So, yeah, because of my association with Hong Kong Hiking Meetup, I do get a lot of customers from Hong Kong as well. All right. Mm. Now, what, what, as a general thing, what sort of training and preparation do you advise prior to doing the trip? Um, yeah, I, I just recommend that people just do um, regular hikes and it doesn't have to be, you know, serious um, uh, yeah, I mean, just regular, regular hiking and, you know, just maybe do that little test to make sure that you can do that five kilometres in three hours with a 500 metre ascent, you know. I think if you can do that, then you, you're fine and most people can do that without training, really. I find I find the people that really struggle tend to be people that um, have not done much hiking in the past and I've actually... Um, actually introduced in the last year uh, a questionnaire to assess people's fitness prior to the trip because yep. I did record a couple of times in the early, in the first few trips, yeah. I must admit, it's, it's, it's a bit like um, uh, Kokoda uh, in Papua New Guinea uh, yeah. or, for that matter, the overland track in Tasmania. People think, yep, I can go and do this, and they, for some reason they decide to pick these trails never having done any or, or much hiking in the last sort of 5, 10, 15 years. So uh, it sort of uh, – it, it tends to catch people out sometimes. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I, th I think, you know, you're doing four days in a row. You're doing uh, 13K, 10K, uh, 13 or 14K, and then another 5 or 6K for the next two days, even if we don't do the big big hike, you know. So you're doing 50Ks over the, over the five days. So you need – to have done a few hikes that are like, you know, 10 to 15 Ks in um, just to make sure that you can you can last that, you know, five or six or seven hours of hiking, you know. We take our time and we have plenty of breaks and all that sort of thing, but you still, you know, there's a lot of these, um, I mean, some of the spots there is an out. You can leave the track and catch a bus, but some of the spots there's no out. Yep. So you have to do the walk. Yeah. 
Now, you meant actually just, just going back a bit, you mentioned that, you know, obviously with the, the cherry blossom April sounds like a really good time to go. When can you walk this trail? I mean, it, can it be walked year round or does it get snowed in or does it become too hot? Um, it's possible that there is snow in winter, but generally, uh, I, I, I have walked it in winter in February and I had a, a little light sprinkling of snow, but nothing that stuck, you know, that caused me to not be able to see the track. Yeah. Um, in summer, it's the rainy season, so it's not advised. But you can do it. You can do it all year round. But the best times are spring and autumn. Okay. And, and I only organise the hikes in spring and autumn, so around cherry blossom time and when the autumn leaves are uh, for, uh, in their full display of colour. But also making sure that... Um, you you miss the typhoon season. <laughs> typhoon season ends ends. It used to end in September, but with uh, lately they've been having the odd one early October. So I, I usually I'm waiting now till mid to late October before I have my uh, autumn hikes. And I mean, is there is it which is more popular, cher- the cherry blossom season or the uh, the autumn foliage season? At the, uh, cherry blossom is the most popular. Yeah. yeah. They book out pretty quick. So now, from a cultural perspective, what's the trip like? I, I can imagine that if someone hasn't done much travel overseas before, all of a sudden we're in a in a, a, a country which um, English is not a first language, and the and the food's different. So, what's yep. what's the cultural um, uh, uh, experience like on this trip? Well, for me, it's the highlight. It's just absolutely amazing. So we stay, um, uh, apart from the first night, is in a hotel in Tana Bay, but o- along the trail we stay in uh, Minshukus, which are family-run guest houses, and the people are just so friendly. The meals are included, and the meals... I, I, had, a, I had an Australian customer last September, and he likened the meal. He said it was better than Tatushi, Tatushu, I think it's called it, in Sydney, the T- restaurant. Tetsuya's. <laughs> That's the one. Yep. <laughs> uh, so the meals are absolutely amazing. And I put a couple of photos of, of, of the meals in with that package. And the other big highlight for me, and the guests love it, is the onsens. So the onsens are the um, spring baths, if you like. So there's a whole ritual with the onsen, which is which is just wonderful. I just love the Japanese culture, you know. So with the with the onsen, you you put on your robe and your bath slippers, and then you walk to the onsen, and then you take off your bath slippers, and then you walk into the change room and you de robe. So and then you walk into the onsen naked. Now there is separate for male and female. And then from there you have a shower and give yourself a good wash. And then once you're thoroughly clean, then you can go into the onsen, which is the bath, and just soak up that and let it uh, wash away all the pain from the hike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're, they're an absolute highlight. And um, an even bigger highlight with the onsens is there's a couple of um, public ones that we that – we, um, can visit while we're on the hike and one of them is just uh, amazing it's in the river in the river at Kawayu and you uh, with with that one you are allowed to keep some uh, pants on or or a bikini or whatever you know um, but yeah it's in the river and then you sort of walk out of that onsen which is on the side of the river and it's quite warm beautifully warm and then you have a dip in the in the river which can be a little bit chilly, but you just go back into the onsen. You know, it's just fantastic. All right. Now let's talk about the highlights of the trip. I mean, you know, and I'm sure this is different from everybody. But what are the what are the key things that people come away, come away raving about after each trip? Yeah, um, it's it's always the meals and the onsens and the minshukus and the friendly people, um, the views. So. Cameras go non-stop while we're walking, <laughs> swimming in the river. Um, the cherry blossoms, you know, when they're out, the, the, there's such great photo opportunities. I just think, um, yeah, and then, of course, the shrines and, and temples and the, um, yeah, just the 
the meditative feel about the place as well. Yeah. So they're the highlights. I think uh, the villages too. There's one village we visit called uh, Yanoname Onsen, and it's actually got a, a stream going through the middle of it, which is hot. It's actually too hot to go into, so it's it's that hot. And they actually have a little tub along the way where you can boil your eggs or boil your vegetables, <laughs> <laughs> which is quite quite unique. All right, now so. You uh, you run a company called Home Comforts Hiking. Uh, yep. How did that come about? Okay, so I'm actually an accountant. <laughs> yep. You can you can tell by the glasses. <laughs> um, yeah, and I was I took a redundancy about three years ago and was um, just wondering what I was going to do next and talking to my wife about it and saying oh, I don't really want to sit behind a desk anymore. Um, and she said, well, why don't you organise hikes? You love hiking. And I, that was the, the trigger. So then from there, um, I got myself organised. So website and insurance and did some training, first aid, wilderness first aid, uh, did the courses in Hong Kong for the hike leading and, uh, and then started organising hikes. So, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a hell of a lot of fun. But it's, um, it was never meant to be a full-time business for me it's a uh, it's it's just something to keep me interested and and to bring in a few extra dollars yeah okay and what what sort of services do you offer in specific in uh, in relation to the uh, communicado trail okay so for the guided hikes uh i'm uh, pretty much so far, anyway, I'm the guide. Um, I have sort of thought about maybe employing guides, but um, unfortunately with um, what's happened with the coronavirus, that's all been put on hold now. So I'm quite fortunate that I actually didn't engage anyone yet. So um, so I didn't have to put anyone off, thank goodness. Um, so I'm the guide. I, I organise all the accommodation, most of the meals, um, all all the um, transfers, et cetera, um, and, yeah, just make sure people have a good time and enjoy the hike. I provide them with information. Um, I get a lot of questions from people that are booked. Yep. Um, so constantly answering questions and, yeah, so that's pretty much the service that I book. Uh, uh, sorry, service that I provide. And, um, yeah, and I do that not just for Kamonokoto. I've got a few other hikes as well. Um, they're all on the website. So. All right, and we'll, we'll put the link to the Home Comforts Hiking website in the show notes as well if people are interested. Thank you. Okay, so you also do you do guided hikes. What about what, are, what about the self-guided hikes? Okay, well, yeah, with the self-guided, so self-guided, a lot of people would prefer to do these hikes without a guide, but um, they, they need to know where they're going and, and you know, uh, how to get around, etc. So... What I provide there is um, I book all the accommodation and most of the meals for them. I provide them with detailed trip notes so that they know exactly where they've got to go, what time. I provide them with maps, a guidebook, uh, bus timetables, all that sort of stuff, you know, so that they um, know exactly where they have to go when and, and, and so forth. So, uh, yeah, so self-guided is quite um popular i've done a few for people over the last couple of years and um yeah that way they they save a bit of money and they get to go when they want to go so that's one big thing so they can choose their own dates and the other thing is that they can you know change the route if the, i actually had some um did a self-guided for some ladies that wanted to do the kohechi which was the tougher one from koyasan so um yeah Unfortunately, they couldn't go because of coronavirus, so they've put it off for a year. Mm. All right. So now b between the two, so with the guided hikes, what sort of um, uh, pack are people carrying? Is it a day pack uh, or yeah. they, do they need to carry every, everything with them or um, what are they actually carrying on a guided hike? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point and I'm glad you brought it up because I forgot to mention it. Yeah, uh, that's the other thing I organise is luggage transfer All for right. the whole, whole trip. So, no, so, yeah. so you, you arrive in Japan, you arrive at the airport, uh, they're picked up uh, or, or they're, they're, they're transported to uh, wherever their first night's accommodation is 
And so really what they're carrying is their 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 stuff they're carrying through the daytime. So Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, just lunch, water and yeah, just a few personal items, camera, etc. So they only need to carry a day pack. And yeah, I meet uh, for the guided walks, I meet them at the airport. Yep. And then we, we travel travel together to the uh, key uh, to Tarnabay where right. we start. Yep. Now, self-guided hikes, can, is it the same sort of thing? Can you organise luggage transfers as well? Or yes. they, uh, uh, or if people are filling in foods and want to carry a full pack, they can, they can also do that? My, um, my prices include luggage transfer, but if they really want to carry their own, <laughs> we can, then we can reduce the price to, and take that out. So. No, that's fair enough. It's, it's always interesting. You, sort of, you arrive in a country and you've got your travelling clothes on and you know, you've, normally, yeah. you've normally got all the, the stuff you don't want to carry with you, but it's nice to know that you don't have to chase around after it. It's being looked after for you. Yeah. Yeah, the luggage transfer is fantastic. Um, uh, there is one rule they have, only one bag with nothing hanging from it. Yep. But the bag can be up to 20 kilos. So you can take pretty much anything you want, you know. Yeah, so the, 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 the hiking style duffel bag is probably a, a good option there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, I just take a normal suitcase on wheels, so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing that the the people that do the self guided hikes are a bit more of the independent types and and yeah. they want to travel at their own pace. Yep, definitely. Yeah. Um, now, is there a limitation on the number of people that can do these, or, or is, is, it, is it based around accommodation? Yeah. So my groups, the maximum number is twelve. Okay. But uh, yeah, I, I it is one of the limiting factors on the Kamonokoto because the Minshukus are all family run guest houses. It's really hard to do bigger groups. Um, but there are some bigger accommodations along the way. Um, and I, I have quoted on a bigger group um, for next year. Um, but yeah, you, you really need to get in early to get the accommodation. And in one village, I actually had to, uh, book two accommodations. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's so right. I, I tend to keep it to 12. 12 is enough for me to be guide for anyway, you know. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. Now, I know this is a bit crystal ball here, but you know, do you, do you see you yourself running hikes in the next uh, next four or five months, or really we're looking at next year from now? I'd love to say that they're definitely going ahead. I've got bookings for October. But, um, yeah, I'm, I sort of have my doubts. Um, I, I've got um, most of my bookings from April have rebooked for April 2021. Yep. So I'm really hoping that by then we'll be able to go again. Yeah. yeah. All right. And you mentioned that um, you're also looking at doing some Australian hikes in the meantime? Yeah. So um, because overseas is out of the question for a while, I've been developing a, a new hike called the Magnificent Mid-North Coast, which is a package of uh, five day hikes with accommodation based in Port Macquarie. Um, so each morning I'd pick up the guests, take them on one of these fabulous uh, local day hikes and then bring them back in the evening or afternoon um, with a few extra side side uh, tourist attractions thrown in as well. And, uh, yeah, so that's, that's going to be on my website in the next... Uh, two or three weeks, I think. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we've been talking to Marcus from Home Comforts Hiking. Thanks very much for your time. Oh, thanks very much, Tim. I really enjoyed the chat. In the second of our interviews, we're going to catch up with hiker Helen Wallace. Helen is a keen hiker who's walked a number of well-known trails and hikes in Australia, Europe and Japan, and in 2018, walked the Kamano Kato Trail. In today's episode, we talked to Helen about her experiences as a hiker and how she found walking this trail. Helen, thanks for taking the time to talk with us. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Now, before we start asking you about the Kamano Kato Trail, tell us a bit about your hiking history. Well, I've done a lot of, over the years, I have done a lot of self-guided walks through Europe, which I really love, and I would do them with my husband. 
And then when I uh, turned 60, I had a retrenchment from my job or redundancy from my job. And I started doing solo long distance hiking. So I would once a year find a walk I wanted to do and I would do that. But in the meantime, I would do a lot of day walks just to keep my training up. Um, So, yeah, lots of little ones and then one big one each year. And, I mean, have you got a preference for the type, the type of hiking you do? Because I live down the beach, I've got the beauty of um, the bay and within an hour's drive I've got the, the rough ocean coastline, which I love. On, on Nothing better on a wild day is to hike down along, along an empty beach with the waves crashing around you. I really love that. I, I guess I'm more a beachy sort of walker than – going into ferns in the dandenongs that we've got down here in Victoria, yep. even though I enjoy it. But I, I, I'm i more a water person, like to like to hike near where there's water. I must admit I'm a bit the same. I, um, I like a bit of variety and it's good where you can get some coastal mixed in with some bushland. Um, you know, it's nothing worse than having a long hike that's exactly the same all the way through. Yes, that, that, that's, that's correct, yeah. So I guess I'm lucky I... I can. I'm in the um, position where I live that within an hour or so, I, I can be in any sort of whether it's bushland, water, or the ferns, um, a few little hills around the place. So yeah, very lucky where I where I am at the moment. And you were saying you live in Port Phillip Bay in Victoria. Yes. Oh, okay. What made you decide to walk the Kamano Kato Trail? Well, I guess. I think the main thing was it was a sister UNESCO World Heritage Walk with the Camano, um, Camino Francis. I I thought, now that would be cool to do that together. So that was one of the reasons. The other one was my daughter used to live in Japan and I had visited Japan a couple of times and just loved it, loved, loved the people, the you know, everything about it. And I thought, well, it's a bit challenging as well. And I like the idea of becoming a dual pilgrim with the um, Camino. So that was um, probably the main reason uh, I, I chose to do it. It just looked so interesting. And the scenery from what I read um, was going to be fantastic. So it was just ticked all boxes. It wasn't that long, which was um, if you're, you know, tight, a bit tight for time, it was quite good because I could go away for about 10 days or so and um, it wasn't like that I was away for months and months. So that was a bonus as well. Okay. Now, there, there appears to be a number of different routes you can choose. Which route did you choose and why? Okay. Well, I chose the – now, I'm going to get canned with my Japanese <laughs> pronunciation, okay? So please forgive me, everybody. Uh, the I chose to do the Nakahashi route. Now, the reason for that, I love walking across countries. So the idea of going from one side of Japan to the other really appealed to me, and this one did. It wasn't coming down the country, but it was going across the country. Okay. And is that is that one of the more common trails, or is that uh, one of the lesser known ones? Oh, I would say it's probably the more more com- most common one, um, as well as you've got the eighty eight temples. Um, but this one, I would say, was the most common one that most people would walk. And is that the is that also known as the Imperial Trail, or is that a different one? That, that's correct. Right. Yes. Yeah, we 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 just we, we just talk, finished talking to Marcus, and again, I I I, I also apologise for butchering the Japanese language. <laughs> Why um, not? Um, uh, yeah, and he said that's certainly the most popular from his perspective. Yes, yes. They, um, there's quite a few routes through that way, and they all sort of intermingle and come back into one another. So, but this, this is that was the one that I chose to do. And was this as a self guided trip, or is that or do, were you doing this as part of an organised group? No, it was a self guided one. I started out with a girlfriend actually, and we had a lot of help from the um, Kamano Kodo Tourist Bureau at Tanabi. 
and they give you maps and things like that, maps and um, brochures, the incline, all that sort of thing. So I started out with a, a girlfriend for one day and then you, the trail is really very well marked so you don't really need a guide and unless you're one of those people that really love to have a guide and they tell you all the ins and outs and the history all that sort of thing. I think that's a fabulous way of doing it. But for myself, I like to do it by myself and do all the history, read all up about it and experience it that way. So it, I would say you would call it a self-guided with the help from the Tourist Brio. Okay, no, that's good. Um, now, how, from your perspective, I mean, you, you sound like you've done a lot of hiking. You mentioned that you were 60 years of age. I'm 68 now. Oh, 68, and when and how when how old were you when you did the uh, did this trail? 66, I would have been. Okay. Now, from your perspective, then, how fit do you need to be to do this hike? Well, I, I think you have to be reasonably fit. There's a lot of tree um, roots that you have to look out for. Awful lot. A lot of the rock stairs, um, things like that. Hilly, the first day I remember thinking, oh, my goodness, what have I got myself in for? Uh, because there were, I couldn't even see the trail markers. It was just full of tree roots and it was going straight up. So that was, that was an in interesting thing. And also, too, I think it depends on the month of the year that you go. I went when it was extremely hot and the humidity was horrendous. And also whether you're going to carry your pack because there's lots of places out there that you can get your pack carried for you. So you might be better you, – you don't need to carry a lot of weight, so that's going to help you with your fitness as well. Yeah. But I carried my pack with me. So I would say you you have to have a reasonable fitness. It's not a flat walk. It, it is quite sharp in spots going up and down. Um, poles definitely need the poles to go with it. I would say. Yeah. Um, yep. Everybody, everybody I saw on on the trail, which wasn't very many people, mind you, but they all had poles that they were walking. So yeah, a bit of pre training, I think you would need for this. Okay, no, that's that's good. It's, I mean, I um, uh, in talking to Marcus, he said this trail was, or this this particular trail was a roughly about thirty eight kilometres long, so not a, a hugely distance wise but it, it sounds like there's some steep sections there that are a bit challenging yes there is and then it, like i went past um when i finished that trail i continued on to um, key katazuri the hike that you can do that's still a marked trail of the kamano kodo pilgrimage as well and um those last days there's one day that's really really steep so yes you you've, you've got to love hills <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so apart from the uh, the fitness side of things, what sort of experience, you know, if you're doing this um, as a self-guided thing, what sort of uh, hiking experience do you need? Well, I think you've got to know how to follow a trail um, to to keep a lookout for your, your, your way markers because sometimes you can get carried away with the scenery or if you're talking to somebody, you miss those. So you do have to be experienced into keeping an eye out for them because sometimes they could be, you know, on a tree or on a rock or somewhere. So you've got to keep an eye out for those sort of things. Experienced in using your poles, I, I would I would guess. Um, and also too, I think you've got, if you're doing it solo, I think you've got to be experienced enough to be happy with travelling on your own in this sort of circumstance. Um, I think, yeah, just reading, doing a lot of reading and researching and, and things like that, being used to doing all that, reading maps and things like that. But once again, it depends if you're doing a guided or a self-guided um, trip. So, but by the sound of it, then if you've if you've got a bit of experience, the self guided is not a bad way to go. If you're still not still learning, but you have the fitness, um, then the guided tours might be a good option. Yes, I, I think you know it, it's great to have hikes that you can do have both and caters for for di you know different hikers. I think that's fabulous. 
but yeah, just have a bit of confidence in yourself that you can do it on your own. You can follow directions on your own. You can get to the from A to B um, on public transport because at the beginning of the the trip, you you stay. Most people stay in Key Tanabi, and then you have to get to the the for the beginning of it, which is only about a 40-minute uh, bus trip yep. at Takajuri. So you've got to be able to, you know, think, yeah, well, I'm comfortable on a bus, so I can't speak the language, um, but but I think I'll be all right, <laughs> um, that sort of thing. Well, that leads us on to the next question then quite well. How did you find the cultural perspective uh, of this trip? So going to Japan, which you, you said you'd been to before? Uh, yes. um, and you know, this is as you say that we 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 Europeans or or, or English speaking countries tend to make the assumption that most people speak English, which is not always the case. So, how did you find the culture uh, and walking in a country where English wasn't the first language? It's interesting. Um, you you smile a lot. That gets you a long way. I yep. think. Um, but the cultural distance, uh, differences that I found, are, are the people people are very precise in what they they do. Everything runs on time, so you've got to be on time for everything. The uh, the difference in the food is huge. So if you're not into, if you like your meat and three veggies. You're not going to perhaps like the food of Japan. I, I'm lucky. I love the food of Japan. So um, it was just amazing, some of the meals and that that I had. Reading the the bus timetables and train timetables, uh, that sort of thing, uh, you've, you've got a, a lot of the time they do have the English – English and the Japanese together, which is quite good, but sometimes they don't. So you've got to be able to um, somehow get around that. The the other thing I think it is when you – the traditions that they have, the cultural traditions they have as in, you know, taking your shoes off, how you bathe, all those sort of things have to be respected because you're in, in a different country – that's their traditions, and you have to follow that. Yeah, it's not, it's not something you think. No, I'm not going to take my shoes off now. I, <laughs> I don't want to take them off. You, it's a tradition, and it's their culture. So that's the, I, I think in any country that's got a culture uh, that's a bit different than your own, I think it's polite to follow that culture. Yeah, yeah. Now, one thing I, I had I thought about was, um, so you're doing homestays on uh, on these hikes? Yes, I did. I did all homestays or Japanese. There was one place I did a Japanese inn. Okay. And that was, yeah, that was my first day. And and um, what's the bedding like there? Is it is it the standard Western style beds, or is it the the rolled out mattress on the floor? No, it's it's the futon on the tanami mat, um, flat out on the floor. And how, how did you find that from a sleeping perspective? Um, well, after walking up hills all day and and um, a few aches and pains, it was pretty funny watching me in the morning trying to get out of bed. It was like <laughs> roll over, <laughs> grab something and up I'd go sort of thing. Uh, but it was quite warm and snug me and beautifully clean in all these places. They're spotlessly clean and uh, it, it, it's quite an interesting experience but didn't didn't really bother me actually. I must admit I've travelled to some reasonably seedy <laughs> sort of places around the world and yeah, you, know, oh, you, yeah. you come across beds that have bed bugs and things like that. But yeah, you know, from what I understand of Japanese culture, cleanliness is seen as part of their cultural norm. So as you say, you you you, you know, getting a good clean bed is is three quarters of having a good night's sleep. I think. Oh, you're you're right there. There's some some really doozy beds out there on on the hiking trail. So it's um they were they were lovely. Now, from a um a point of view of the trip, um. What were the highlights of the trip for you? Well, I think the scenery would have to be, um, for me, the main one, like standing on those mountains and, and just watching the mist um, come up and down on the hilltops. I'll never forget it. It, it, was, it was just magnificent. I 
took your breath away how beautiful it was. Um, the people, of course, the people were were unbelievably friendly and kind. I um, I had a bit of a, a tumble when I was on that trip, and the way that people looked after me was just amazing. I, I, I you learn something like that. You you learn how to be kinder to strangers and and make an effort to help people when they need. And and they were they were just so wonderful to me. Um, the food, I loved the food, and and I did. Um, I always, when I stayed at the homestays, I had uh, dinner with them and breakfast, and then I would order a lunch. So they would pack you up a little lunch, and when you opened it at lunchtime, it was just beautiful. It was all done in little beautifully. It was like a little Christmas present that you'd get every lunchtime. <laughs> so that was a real highlight. The the food part of that. And what actually? What 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 did you actually? What what, what was a breakfast? What was a, a dinner? And what was a lunch meal? What what did that look like? Oh my goodness gracious! Um, the food, the breakfast. You would come down to the breakfast table. There would be about twenty bowls, and you would have anything from miso soup to pickled um, uh, eel, rice, egg. Pickled vegetables, always, always, oh, and always something warm, you know, like your warm soups and things like that to to start you off. Yeah. Lunch, lunch was what, uh, some sushi, uh, a little drink box they would have. Sometimes they'd have little chocolates in there for you, little packet of potato chips or something like that. But the main meal, you could have something rolled in like a banana leaf type thing and it would be rice with something inside it and yep. it could be a, a vegetable or tuna or chicken, a uh, little bottle of water they would always put in. And then as you're walking out the door, they would be saying, oh, have this, have this. And so they would be giving you some extra fruit or an extra bottle and you think, oh, my goodness, that's extra weight I'm going to be carrying sort of thing. <laughs> but, you, but you couldn't not take it from them because they were so adorable. And then dinner was much was, – was amazing. You would have about 40 bowls of on your table, all intricate little vegetables cut so beautifully in little flowers or – little birds, you would have a little cold coal fire that you would cook meat on, that you would cook it yourself, yep. uh, as well as some vegetables. Soup again, you would have your miso soup and that would always arrange. Sometimes you would have potato in it, sometimes mushrooms in it. That was a little treat to see, you know, each night what you had in your miso soup. And then you would have a dessert of ice cream or one some sort of fruit as well so you it was just stunning the, it was a art the whole breakfast lunch and dinner <laughs> was just an, an art in itself and you didn't really want to be eating too much because it was so beautiful i think that's the thing with japanese food it's about the appearance as well as the taste isn't it oh yes it's, it's just just stunning beautiful i loved it now what, what about the temples how did you find those i found them quite beautiful but i i must admit I read about what you do at the temples, how you wash your hands and have a drink and, and cleanse yourself and then do the bowing and the clapping and things like that. But I always felt a, a bit apprehensive if somebody was washing, watching me if I would do it wrong. Yeah. And I don't think they would care if you did it wrong or not, you know, but um, I was I was quite um, a bit scared sometimes if I, if I couldn't remember to do it precisely if there was people around yeah yeah and the, the buildings themselves are, are pretty spectacular they're gorgeous and they range from they're never over the top um as in opulent but they're very stunning and peaceful and calming very stylized in 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 their looks and sometimes like the little shrines and that that were out in the, particularly the first one that you go th you go to just before you walk through the the main part to go on the on the Kamano Kodo, it was just beautiful. It had it was in these bushes, beautiful cedar trees around it, and little red roof, and they had a 
a gong that you were to uh, grab and, and, and dong as you started the walk and it would just resonate and sort of echo through through the trees, which was quite beautiful. But they were always very calming and peaceful. I, I love them. No, yeah, that's good. That's good. What about the lowlights? What were the negatives from your perspective for, for your trip? Well, I think my little tumble down the stairs was a bit of a low light, but I I don't I don't tend to have low lights because I, I feel in life I'm pretty lucky to do what I'm able to do, and if I get lost or if I you know stumble or you know, may, maybe just do something wrong or whatever, I'll, I'll stand for a minute and think, geez, how lucky. How many people would love to be in my shoes right this minute, you know, to see these mountains and things like that. So I, in any of my walks, I don't tend to focus on a low life because I always think that whatever I've done to get into a situation that I may be in, there's a learning experience there for me and I'll just stand back and think, well, I'm so lucky I, I, I am where I am. So, yeah, I, I don't tend to have a have too many low lights. All right. That's a, that's a good philosophy to live by. Well, I think it gets you out of a, a lot of trouble that you could get into and, and, and not having to panic if, if you're a bit lost, you know. You just think, well, you should have been taking a bit more attention or, <laughs> or something like that. I must admit, I uh, particularly when I'm doing long distance hikes, you know, you, you expect to fall over at least once or type um, once or twice. You you either trip over your own feet or you know you're not paying attention and, <laughs> and, you, and you, you stumble. And it's probably the the worst thing to do is yeah, you don't mind it so much when you're by yourself, but when you're in front of a group of people and you choose to do it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you tend to look up and you think, "Oh gosh, did somebody see me?" You know? <laughs> now, I, I suppose I'd say, um, from a perspective, you know, would you recommend this trip to others that that, that were thinking about doing it? Oh, hundred percent. Without without even um, a flicker, I. I missed a couple of little spots because of the typhoon that went in before me and there yep. was a couple of landslides and and I don't tend to repeat walks. I, I like to do a new walk, but this would be one that I would do again. I'd do it in a different season. I certainly wouldn't do it in the typhoon season. So that's I, that would be a big recommendation. Don't do it in the typhoon season. Uh, but yes, totally recommend it. It's it's wonderful. Okay, so we've been talking to Helen Wallace uh, about the Kamano Kodo Trail. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks so much. In the last of our interviews today, we talked to hiker Kelly Briggs about her experience on the Kamano Kodo Trail in November 2019. Kelly, thanks for taking the time to talk with us today. Thanks, Tim, for having me on your podcast. I'm very excited to be able to speak to you about Kamano Kodo. All right. Now, first up, just tell us a bit about your hiking history. What got you into hiking and what sort of hiking do you do? Um, my hiking history is my, my father was a very adventurous type. And in our younger years, uh, he used to let us out of the, the car in the middle of nowhere. We'd run <laughs> like feral cats everywhere and explore and pick up sticks and all sorts of things. And I think that I got that sense of adventure from my father. And then in my late teens, my parents bought some land up at the Grampians and built a house. So our family holidays, we often had um, t trips away to the Grampians and we did a lot of the walks up around the Grampians, which we really loved. And then as I got older and I started travelling myself, um, I started to um, revisit my younger hiking years when I was in the US and did Yosemite and Bryce Canyon and Zion and Grand Canyon. And yeah, but uh, somewhere in there, life and work gets in the way and uh, you reach a bit of a hiatus. And, um, and then one day you just seem to have this sort of a shift and think I've got to get back to something that I really enjoyed doing, something I felt that was really good in my life. So, yeah, my hiking history came from a very um, a, a young age of, you know, adventure that my father instilled in us. Now, if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? 
I am now. I am fifty nine years of age. I'll be sixty a bit later this year. All right. So you're you're pretty much the same age as I am. Look, I think I think you've got a few months on me, but I think we're we're both part of a generation where we disappeared from home and then came back at the end of the day. And um, I think you know, the the spirit of adventure and going out and exploring was part of our generation. I think so. It's uh, yeah. It's, it's good to I see agree. that it's good to see that people are coming back to that again. All right. Now, what made you decide to walk to walk the Komodo Kodo Trail? Um, back in, uh, 2018, um, I, I walked the way of St. James, which is one of the Santiago, the Camino de Santiago walks. And I did the full walk of 800 kilometers across Spain and I absolutely loved it. And, uh, not long after I got back, I was watching, um, or reading some, feedback that was on a Pilgrim Facebook page and I saw someone there talking about the Kamano Kodo and they were going to get dual pilgrimage and I'm like, what, what's all this? And I looked into it and I researched it. I realised um, that you could get dual pilgrimage um, and do this second UNESCO pilgrimage through Japan. So... I suppose to me, again, my sense of adventure and I like to accomplish something that's a little bit different to what other people are doing. Um, and then the history, when I realised the history of the Kamano Kodo, that was a big driver for me too. So it didn't it didn't sort of take me long to decide that um, Kamano Kodo would be a really good walk for me to do. So there are a number of options for walking the Kamano Kodo Trail. How did you choose yep. the route that you did? Um, a bit like I did for the Camino, I chose probably the most commonly walked one because it's a really good introduction. Uh, I had not been to Japan before. I knew nothing about Japan, really. It wasn't, it's not been a destination that yells or screams at me to come visit and explore that culture. So when I thought this could be a good way for me to, be, to, to learn a bit more about Japan, I got a couple of the guidebooks. I went back um, for a company that I use that's based here in Victoria. They sort of organise the itineraries for you and do all the logistics. I got some details from them as well. So the route that I walked was, and I probably will not pronounce this right because I can hardly speak English, let alone try and pronounce something that's Japanese, but it's called the Nakahechi Trail. And when I was reading about the history of it, um, all the different ruins that you can go through and uh, the temples and uh, my my historical side of my brain went mental. I thought I'm going to absolutely love that. That's going to be fantastic. Um, so when I had a read of that routing, I thought that's the one for me. Now, so you- again, I'm just kept to um, kept to the basics, like. If you, you're beginning, you're not sure about where you're going or what you're doing, it is sometimes good to choose the road that's most trodden. Yeah, yeah. So that you can learn from that. And now I would feel comfortable now if I had to go back to Japan on my own and walk alone through the forest, I feel more comfortable about doing that because I understand the signage and I understand the cultural aspects of it. Whereas um, I would have been quite nervous to go to Japan on my own and walk across a peninsula and spend days and wonder if I'm going in the right direction. Because <laughs> unlike, Cam- unlike the Camino, this is all through the mountainous region of Japan, whereas the Camino goes through lots of little villages. So about every three to four kilometres, you've got a little town you can get to where there's a pharmacy and a shop. There's no pharmacies, there's no shops out in the middle of these Japanese peninsulas. You are on your own. You take everything on your back for the day. Um, no one's got a taxi. They're not going to come and get you, as in opposed to being on the Camino. If you're having a hard day or you've had a gut full of it, you can just, you know, phone up Jose and he'll come and get you in the taxi and take you to your next spot. So making a decision to walk the Kamano Kodo, I think it is better for people to choose quite a traditional route, which is well trodden, and you'll come across people through the day if, you, if you're struggling Etc. Now, did you um, did you do this uh, as a guided trip or a self guided trip? Self guided. Um, that company I use 
uh, put the itinerary together, yep. and they will ship ship my main piece of luggage ahead for me, and I take a day pack. Yep. So being Japan, I didn't have much luggage. Not like um, when I went to Europe to walk the Camino through Spain, I was doing a bit of pre and post Camino travelling, so I had quite a large suitcase to be transported. This time. I had a small suitcase, and but most of my stuff fitted in my backpack anyway. But they they just sort of transport it along if you don't want to carry all your gear for the day. Um, and I look again. I people frown a bit when they hear about these companies putting your Camino or your pilgrimages together. I think they're fantastic. Um, I've here at the bed and breakfast. You know, I'm often really time poor because I I'm the owner operator. And I don't get time to do all the fun stuff like the research and the reading and then you'd have to book all the accommodation. And in Japan, you're dealing with the names of places. Everything sounds more foreign because it's, you know, it's not easy to pronounce it. You don't even know where these towns are. Whereas when you look at the, the maps over Spain, you get more of an idea of where you're walking. Oh, that's a bigger city. I won't have any trouble getting accommodation. Um, it was just easy for me to use that company again. And I think that I would still like to, for future trips, I'll go back and do more of the Kamano Kodo, different routes. Yeah. I would still source out getting a company to actually put it together and pre-book the accommodation. Think- so a lot of the accommodation only holds four or five people. Yeah, I was going to say. I think that I think that's the thing. I think uh, um, as as you say, if 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 you if you if you're camping in a tent and it doesn't matter where you stay, it's not an issue. Uh-huh. But when you when you are relying on there being accommodation at a particular town or location, um, you know, yeah, it's it's much better to say, well, okay, I, this is organised and arranged. And so, as you say, sometimes it's just easier if some you know you ring yeah. up somebody and say, look, can you do this for me? And yeah, you get all all the pressure's taken away. Yeah, and if, as I said, if you're if you're working full time, and a lot of people, you know, they get three four weeks off work each year, and um, they just want to be able to work up to the time that they're departing on these trips. You don't have to spend time and watching emails. What does that mean? The language differences. I some of the um, challenges that I've heard from people who have booked. Kamano Kodo and the accommodation is I haven't had a response or I got a response and it still didn't say if I'm actually concerned. Yeah. Or So there's too many questions and I didn't have time to deal with that. So it was easy just to go back through the company I'd used previously and say, I want to do the autumn walking trip. I know how many days it is. I had a very small window available to me at the end of last year in autumn between um, guests here at the B and B coming and going. I thought I've really only got a ten day period. I haven't got time to be mucking around or losing days because I can't get accommodation or yeah. the day, it's going to take me longer. Or yeah, so it just slotted in nice and easy. I worked here up until pretty much the day I left. I flew out from Albury to Sydney and met up with my um, friend Megan. Then we flew direct from Sydney to Osaka. We had a couple of days in Osaka and then we made our own way uh, to the meeting point in um, Tanabi. And once we met up in Tanabi, we had our briefing and they stuck us all in cabs and sent us to our first night's accommodation and then we commenced walking the Kamano Kodo the next day. So the same as the Camino de Santiago, we walked every kilometre that everybody else walks. It's only that we used the company to pre-book our accommodation for us. So we're still walking all the same distances. There's no one, no one standing with a tray of champagne at the end saying <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> come and come and sit by the pool for ten minutes and have a nice glass of wine. We're still doing the hard yards like everybody else. It's only that we've chosen to go with a company, and the company I use is Australian owned. It's yep. got a really good name, and yeah, why not? Now, you said you went in autumn. What was your reason for choosing autumn? Oh, God, I love walking in autumn. Uh, I love travelling in Europe in autumn as well. That's just my favourite time of year. I'm a really – I'm a fair-weather walker. Um, I like to walk when it's hotter than cooler. Yep. And I love the autumn – 
autumn foliage color is just beautiful. So for me to walk through Japan with all those beautiful foliage colors, and seriously, every time you went around a corner or over a hill, you just stand there gawking at all the beautiful colors, the red of the Japanese maples and all the golden amber colors. It was, it was stunning. It was yeah, stunning. No, I think I'd, I'd, I, it'd be a real toss-up for me. I like the idea of walking through cherry blossom season, but I also love the idea yeah. of, of walking through, through autumn foliage as well. The other plus with walking through that, um, in the November is you are at the end of the typhoon season. Yep. So the two weeks leading up to our, depart- our departure, um, which was around about the 10th of November, the two weeks leading in, it was bucketing down in Japan all over the peninsula. We were seeing posts on the Kamano Kodo Facebook page. People were showing it was like waterfalls. They were walking down the paths and it was like waterfalls pummeling past them. And I was pretty terrified. And that was a typhoon which was affecting Japan um, last November. Yeah. Uh, sorry, in October. And pretty much within a day, all that finished and the sun came out and we went over there and we had uh, perfect walking weather every every day. The mornings and the afternoons got chilly but the daytime was beautiful down to T-shirts and just really pleasant walking. Yeah, so, it's, it's always the thing, isn't it? You, uh, you're you at the mercy of the weather and you don't mind a bit of rain, but when it's a typhoon, it's a bit different. Yeah. So we had heard that the time of year that we travelled, which was the mid-November, was very good and uh, the weather was perfect. It was very nice. Now, from a, a fitness perspective, um, what 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 what's your uh, impression of of how fit do you need to be as a walker to do this trail? You need um, a reasonable level of fitness to do Kamano and Kodo. I think what you need to be tougher with is have that mental fortitude to pull yourself up out of a rut if you're absolutely exhausted. You need to be able to pump yourself up and say, right, put on the big girl pants, I've got to keep going. There's no point saying I'm tired and I'm really over it now because there is. it's not like you can hail a bus or get a taxi to come and get you because you've run out of path. You're in the middle of the forest. You've got to yeah. keep going. So I think um, to do the Kamano Kodo, you do need a pretty good, reasonable level of fitness to be able to walk up maybe 10 flights of stairs yeah. Run back down it, run it up again, run back down it, and then not to be able to say, oh, I'll give that up and go to the coffee shop. You've got to mentally say, I'm going to make myself do it again, up and up and up. So um, I think good level of fitness, but also mentally tough, mentally tough. And what, what sort of training and preparation did you do prior to the trip? I mean, you, you're, you're walking fairly regularly but as, as, your, as your business allows? Yeah, I, um, I'm pretty lucky here where I live in Rutherglen. Glen. I'm, I'm in, um, I've got about four national parks and quite a few state forests near me. So I go out doing um, bush walks and training uh, pretty much every other day. And then once or twice a week, I'll do a long 22-kilometre or quite a strenuous hike. But the preparation for Kamano Kodo uh, which is very, it's a very physically demanding walk. Um, it was really hard for me to find places in Australia or anywhere near me, to be honest, um, where I could force myself to walk uphill for more than half an hour. In Japan, I was walking uphill all day and then downhill all afternoon. So the training I did was just to find every hill that I could. Um, and go up and down and up and down. And sometimes it was a case of just spending the afternoon on one hill because it was steep enough and it had rough terrain underfoot and lots of steps. Steps is, um, Stepping is what you do the most of on the Kamano Kodo. So you're either stepping up or stepping down. And the steps can be anything from sort of like bluestone boulders to moss-covered stones. Yep which are very slippery. Um, I use hiking poles, and I, I would not even imagine trying to do Kamano Kodo without a pair of hiking poles. It would just be diabolical. That's, that seems um, to be, be the consensus of everyone I've talked to on this, this, about this episode. 
uh, just to even have your balance and to take the pressure off your toes as you're coming down. I mean, you could be you could be going downhill for three or four hours. And it's quite jarring on the toes and on your knees and your hips. So to have the poles in front of you to be able to help you down. And some of the steps, I mean, I'm tall, I'm five foot nine. Some of those steps were so big that I felt myself having to see myself sideways to step down because they were so steep or the same going up. From a, you did this, you did this as a, uh... Uh, as a self-guided t- uh, walk, what sort of level of experience yep. as a hiker do you need? I mean, you know, so uh, ignoring physical fitness, you know, do you need to yeah. be able to navigate? Uh, what's 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 the sort of skills you need if you are doing this as a self-guided walk? As a self-guided walk, I think you need to have done a lot of research and read as much as you can about um, Kamano Kodo or any walk that you're going to do. So if you're bushwalking in general and you've got a good level of fitness, um, you should also apply yourself to do as much research as possible. Uh, some of the research I do, and particularly with the Kanano Kodo, was I went onto YouTube and I looked up clips. And what that helped me to do was to find um, Kanano Kodo footage where there were people about my age, my yeah. demographic. Yeah. So if I could see, oh, they had a pretty good level of fitness or they started to fess up that they've done the Camino de Santiago or they're they're a regular bushwalker, um, then I would actually follow those YouTube clips to have a look at the terrain and where they'd be huffing and puffing and what's the look on their face. You can tell a lot by the look on people's faces about how much they're suffering. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, um, I think my experience, apart from my bushwalking um, experiences, to do as much research as you can. Now, from what about from a cultural perspective? How did you find, um, you're saying you hadn't been to Japan before this trip. How did you find the, no. the, the, the culture? It was everything I thought it was going to be, as I said before. I did quite a bit of researching. And so I had a, I'd already exposed myself to some of the, the cultural highlights of Japan and the Kamano Kodo, and its authenticity was real. So when I arrived in Osaka, um, being a foodie, we went straight out to the food streets and we wanted to find <laughs> the smallest laneways with the smallest bars, a bit like the Midnight Diner. Yeah. And we, my friend and I, Meg and I, we actually found something that looked exactly like Midnight Diner where maximum six people could sit at a bar and eat. No one spoke English and everyone was looking at us like who were the two little white girls down the end of the bar. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, yeah, but we made ourselves knowing that we were going to be walking Kamano Kodo and that we were from Australia and that we were having some beers and next thing, you know, they were all smiling and cheesing us. And, yeah, so the culture was lovely even when we went seeking out these small little eateries in Osaka was fantastic. Um, And then the days of walking around Osaka and we got a young girl called Yoko off Airbnb experience. And she took us to the castle in Osaka and she made us um, green tea at the castle. So she gave us like this experience that she does. And she was reasonably priced. I think it cost us about $30 each for most of the afternoon. And she took us around the gardens there. And then she actually showed us in Osaka. um, It's a big piece of granite near one of the big railway stations where she meets you. And she took us over. She said, this is where the Kamano Kodo begins. And we said, where? She says, here, this big rock. And on the rock, it's all in Japanese on a bronze plaque, and there's a picture depicting um, uh, people getting off a boat. And she pointed down to the river in Osaka, and she said, that river goes to Kyoto. So when the emperors all came for Kamano, they came down from Kyoto on the boat and got off here in Osaka, and then they walked from here to the key peninsula and commenced Kamano. So it was all there, and, uh, yeah, we never knew about this rock, and Yoko showed us, and then when I posted that on Facebook, everyone wanted to know exactly where it was, so we provided the um, the details on the Facebook pages 
and next thing we had people saying, oh, we'll be there next month, we're going to go to that rock and and find out, you know, where the true beginning of it was. So culturally, it was really lucky that we met someone like Yoko. And then she said, oh, well, because you're doing Tamanakoto, I'll show you where the emperors used to land the boats and they'd get off and they would walk all the way to the Key Peninsula from Osaka. So culturally, that was a real highlight for us. How, how did you, um, how did you cope with the food and the and the bedding? How, was that was that was oh, that? I loved it. I loved it, and I couldn't find enough ramen. I loved it. <laughs> and if I had been aware of this previously, is that there's an area called Wakiyama, which is on the train route through to Tanabi to Kitanabi, where you commence the Kamano from. I would have got off there because it's the ramen capital of Japan. Yeah, I must admit, so, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Japanese food. So, yeah, I just I love anything that's in a bowl, like a big soup with noodles in it. And uh, so, the next time I travel back to do another section, I would like to do the Koyasan section of um, the Kamano Kodo. I'm going to make sure one, I go to Kyoto, I want to go there, and also to stop off in Wakayama for a couple of days and just enjoy that town and all of its traditional ramen. I think it'll be good. But um, Japan, I, it's not a country that screens come and visit me so much. And it's still a country that I really, I did enjoy going to it, but I think I enjoyed it because I was going for the Kamano Kodo. Now, from the point of view of the trip itself, what were the main highlights for you? What did, what, what did you really say, hey, this is, this is really wonderful, I'm glad I did it because of, because of this? I think the first the first um, main takeaway will be how wonderful it was to walk another Camino or have another opportunity to walk a Camino with Megan. Megan and I, as I said, we were paired up as room buddies um, for the Camino de Santiago in Spain and we never knew each other from a bar of soap and from the minute we got together, we were like we've known each other forever. And to have the opportunity to go and spend another 10 days with Megan was, was really fantastic. Um, another takeaway was just the accomplishing my dual pilgrimage. It was a real thrill uh, to, you know, there's only two UNESCO pilgrimage walks in the world. That's the Camino de Santiago and the Camano Kodo. And we both received our dual pilgrimage when we reached Honggu. And we felt like we had we'd been able to give something back to the universe for our efforts. I was rewarded, and I felt really surrounded by joy having accomplished that. So I felt really rewarded to be given another um, certificate of accomplishing this pilgrimage that pairs up with something that was really special to me, like the way of St. James. Yeah. Um, and you, and you obviously, by the sound of it, you love the, the autumn foliage as well? The autumn foliage was really beautiful. And if you like the fall colours and you like walking and you like Japanese food, because it's all Japanese food, even the breakfast, which yep. can be very confronting, <laughs> Um if you like a beer, you like camaraderie, uh, w- running into people in the middle of a forest, if you're afraid of people, this is not the place for you. If you like walk along and you run into some person that's sitting there on the side of the walk and you're like, who is this person? Why are they sitting out here? You'll love it. You'll get talking to people and realise that, you know, there is a six degrees of separation. They were either walking Camino when you were walking it or they're your brother's best friend or <laughs> you used to work at the same hospital as them but you never met them years ago. Or Yeah, there's always that six degrees of separation. So um, I think if people, and I know that a lot of bushwalkers, they feel the same. You have, it's like a community feel. So you must like people. Even though you're going to be out there on your own walking, when you when you come across someone, it's like your long lost friend. You've got to speak to these people, and you've got to know and learn everything about them within the two minutes that you've stopped to have a yarn with them while you're on this walk. All right. So, what about the negatives? Were there any anything that you didn't like about the trail, or or the the, the your trip in particular? 
Um, I didn't have any negatives. I had a terrific time. My only day that I was a little bit um, flat was a self-inflicted hangover from a night <laughs> in Koguchi around an outdoor fire with some other Aussies and an American couple. And uh, we were patting ourselves on the back about how we've all got to that point and we got our dual certificates and everyone thought we'd conquered it. We have one more day to go. One more day we had. And we said, ah, it's only 14 kilometres. It'll be easy peasy. And tomorrow it'll all be finished. So we got stuck into the Sapporo's and found some wood and the guy said we could start an outdoor fire and you, you know what happens when there's about 12 <laughs> Australians. It just got out of control. It was ridiculous. So the next morning we had to go, we had to leave pretty early about 7.30 because um, we were told that it will take around about seven to eight hours to do these 14 kilometres. And I said to Megan, it's, it's only around 1,100 metres. Um, high that we've got to get to today and we're already like halfway up the mountain I think I think they're overestimating the amount of time I think they're over I kept saying I think they're overestimating um, what this was going to be like so we all woke up in the morning and we're all shabby we've all got hangovers from drinking this beer so we head off and it turned out that the whole day ends up being around 18 kilometres Yep. Uh, just over a thousand meters, and it was very technical. So, to give you a bit of an, an idea, if people can get these statistics around their head, we walked it in seven hours. Four of those hours was moving time. Yep. Yep. And the other three hours was resting, catching your breath, and admiring the scenery. So, that, that tells you how challenging, how meant, how physically challenging that last day was and it didn't help that we all had hangovers. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there was one particular, I bet you other people that you've interviewed, Tim, have, said, have mentioned this, is a, a slope called the body breaking slope. <laughs> and it's, it's uh, a five-kilometre uphill section of Kamano Kodo on the last day heading into Natchisan. And it rises over 800 metres to the Echizen Togi Pass. And when you get to this pass, it's the first time you see the Pacific Ocean out um, off the coast of Japan. So the first time you've actually gone across the peninsula, you see the Pacific Ocean. Um, when we got to the top of that, I seriously thought my lung was going to come up out of my mouth. I'd never breathed so hard and my body really never ate. So for over five kilometres going uphill nonstop, and this is just, this is not like walking up a slope. This is all steps, which are tree roots, moss covered stones, uh, sticks, something that looks like it was probably either a waterfall or a riverbed, just trying to scale up that and then come down the other side. Uh, it's really, it was really technical to do that. Um, so, yeah, you asked me about low lights, not many, <laughs> but uh, don't drink too much Sapporo on that second last day and then think you're going to be able to do it. You, we probably could have um, – we all got into bed pretty early that night, but we'd, from about 3 p.m. we'd been on the Sapporos and sitting around the fire and talking and, yeah, and it was an early start and it got really cold as we got high up in the altitude and then – coming back down and then up again and down again. And, yeah, it was a, it was a tough um, a tough 18 kilometres. And when we reached the end of the day, I think everyone was glad it was over. Um, from your perspective, would you recommend that people do this trail? Absolutely, yeah. If you've got a really great sense of adventure, you're interested in the Japanese culture and the history or in the footsteps of the emperors, um, there's lots of history boards and storyboards along the Kamano Kodo trail that I did. So it's easy to follow the history that's in English and in Japanese. There's lots of signposts 
and there weren't as many opportunities like on the Camino de Santiago to stop. There's no like coffee shops or anything like that where you can buy food, but there's plenty of places um, where you can stop and have your lunch. So when you stay in the typical or the traditional accommodation each night, part of your accommodation package is your meal at night yep. and your breakfast the next morning, and they give you your lunch in a little bento box. Yeah. So you put your bento box in your backpack and pack your water or get them to put hot water in the thermos and then off you go for the day. And uh, just, I, I would say it, it's a really, it's a good walk to do. I think the if you don't, if you just normally do bushwalking and you can walk 10 or 12 kilometres, I think you need to put a lot more training in for the hills and find places where you're going to do lots of uphill steps and downhill steep slippery slopes and get used to using your poles correctly um, because if, if you don't, you might find that you won't enjoy it as much because you, it's challenging. It's really technically challenging and mentally draining to do this type of walk. But I would say that most people who enjoy bushwalking that have done the Camino or have an idea of what how hard it's going to be, they will, they will absolutely love it. All right, that's good. Okay, so we've been talking to Kelly. So thank you for taking time to talk to Australian Hiker about your trip on the Kamano Kodo. Yep, you're welcome. It's been my pleasure and I hope that people can take something out of this interview. Okay, so that was a series of three interviews on the Kamano Kodo Trail in Japan. Uh, and as you would have heard, particularly li listening to Marcus's interview, it's actually a series of trails uh, that uh, all pretty much end at the one main shrine. So you've got the option of being able to pick and choose. You know, you pick the, the most common one, the Imperial Trail, or pick the harder ones, depending on what sort of experience that you want to go through and do. Yeah, I think I've found it really interesting. There were lots of similarities in in. Uh what they were saying from Marcus to Helen to Kelly about the experience around uh, the culture um, and the the shrines. I thought it was interesting that the food was rivaling Tetsuya's, which uh, for those who don't know is a very fancy and also very expensive um, restaurant in Sydney. Um, so that was a kind of a nice thing that you, you're able to experience something um, a little bit similar um i think the thing for me also was the main choice that you needed to make uh whether you wanted to see the cherry blossoms or um experience the autumn foliage color you had to really sort of make a choice between those two yeah and and, that, and that's often a hard thing i mean you know the uh, um uh, the two hikers we talked to both did them in uh, uh, in autumn um, Marcus is saying that most of his trips and certainly the most popular trips are in spring with the cherry blossom and certainly when you think about Japan it's always the cherry blossom uh, but I, I, I'm also a big fan of autumn foliage so I'd be happy to go with the time um, well, I was a big fan of autumn foliage until this week when our autumn foliage uh, landed on our deck but <laughs> yeah it looks, looks really good until unless you have to clean it up um, so yeah, it, it, it is a matter of deciding what it is you're trying to get out of it, at it. Um, yeah, and he, in, and while he was saying that the cherry blossom time, certainly from a perspective in Japan, it's, it's one of the more popular times. Uh, and he's saying that there's a lot of people at the shrines, particularly at that time of the year, but they're all sort of bus based. So the walkers, the numbers of walkers really probably doesn't change too much uh, from one season to the next. It's just you can have a bit more crowd at the actual shrines themselves. Mm. Um, so I think the times to avoid, uh, he's saying that while he, Marcus was saying that while it can be a bit of snow, um, it's usually not an issue, but he said definitely avoid uh, the typhoon season, as did uh, our two hikers as well. So it's um, um, you know, it's like anything, you know, you don't go to uh, uh, central Australia in the middle of cyclone season. It's, uh, you know, while it's doable, it's not, not the best time of the year to head there. Um, from a perspective of training, and again, this was a common theme between all three of our interviewees. They're saying that the trails, 
or the main trail itself is not overly long, and, and certainly you can choose longer versions of this trail. Um, but it's more about the hills, both the, the up and the down, um, where you're doing, you know, spending much of a, of a day just going in one direction, up a hill or down a hill. So it's it's the sort of thing, you know, for me, I coming downhill doesn't do my knees any favour. Um, so it's, uh, you know, there's definitely no way knowing I would be doing this trail without tracking poles, and that's something that was repeated by all three hikers. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think um, that was my sense too, that I, I um, while the hills probably didn't sound too onerous in terms of altitude, it was probably the... Uh, the persistence of them, uh, you know, you're always going up or always going down from what I understood. And I think I think the thing with it as well, I mean, if you have a look at the uh, the, the show notes for this podcast episode, uh, we've got some examples of, of the trails, you know, and there are roots, there are rocks in some area that are covered in moss. Um, so you do want to make sure you've got the, uh, uh, the tracking old poles with you. Uh, Helen did indicate that she had a fall, uh, and she sent a lovely photo for us to, to use, and, <laughs> and she looks like I think she's she's used her face. She to, fell to, on her face to, to, to stop stop at the uh, the fall, and yeah, it, it's one of those things. It's it's bad enough when you do it; it's just really embarrassing when when there are other people around as well. Um, I think the experience that if you're doing the mainstream walks, the imperial route, um, it's probably, in, in a lot of cases, really this is what we're talking about is glamping. Um, you're staying in accommodation at night time, you're having a shower, someone's giving you a meal, you've got the meal the next day and you're getting a, a packed lunch to take with you. So, you know, it, you know you're, and, the, and in most cases your, your baggage is actually being transferred from one night's accommodation to the next. So really, uh, in most cases, all you're going to be doing is carrying a day pack. But, you know, the choice is there. Look, I think this is a really interesting one because it's, it, this is, you know, uh, that old uh, question about is it the journey or the destination? This is definitely a journey um, hike. Uh, it's about what you experience during the day and the opportunity to be unencumbered by a heavy pack and, um, you know, explore the shrines and and absorb the, the, the local culture and enjoy the local food and those sorts of things um, and engage with people, I think, uh, as well. So, you, you know, I think uh, glamping's got a Bit of, bit, bit of a bad name. It's not considered to be um, serious hiking. Uh, there's some serious hiking here, and I think there's a real experience as well that you get out of it. So the key things that people loved about this walk, uh, so as, as Jill said, the culture, and that includes the people, and, the, and, 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 and all three of our interviewees saying the people are just amazing. They're so friendly. They want to help you with everything you're doing. Uh, and I think this is, this is one of these things that the Japanese culture is known for is, is you know, they just want to look after their visitors. The food. Uh, now, not everybody likes Japanese food. I know that, uh, but you know, both Jill and I are lovers of Japanese food. So, yep. but, yeah, but it is a bit different when you you don't get toast and, and cornflakes for breakfast. You're getting fish, uh, but that's just something to get used to in a different culture. We did have some relatives who recently went to Japan, or at least before coronavirus, anyway. Um, I'm not sure what they were expecting, but yeah, they 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 weren't too fussed about the culture or the food. <laughs> I don't know why they went to Japan, but <laughs> uh, the hot springs, the onsen, uh, and again, that's that's something that you know you don't always get these sort of things on walks. Sometimes you pick them up, sometimes you don't. But it's nothing nothing better than being able to stop towards the end of a day or even during a day and having a a nice hot spa, basically. Um, and you know the other thing around um, the the bathing, it's it's such a ritual thing as well. So you know the whole, um, uh, you, you know, putting on a robe and going in and and um, having a, having a shower and getting clean before you then go into the the baths and those sorts of things. I mean, you know, just just understanding how that works and why some of that is in place you know i think that that'd be a great experience the um 
The other thing that um, it's also worthwhile considering as well, I mean, you know, it was interesting listening to all three interviews, even though this is a trail that's well known for their shrines. And, and in fact, this is probably one of the main reasons that this is a World Heritage set of trails. Um, by far, the, the real standout for everybody was the landscape, you know, the scenery, the landscape, the hills, the rivers, um, that seemed to uh, overshadow the shrines in some respects. So um, while the shrines, are, 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 by the look of it, are really worthwhile visiting, uh, it's just the landscape is so spectacular that uh, I think, you know, it, it, it surprised me in some respect. What was also mentioned by the hikers as well is that this is a sister trail to the Camino in, in, in Spain and France. Uh, and if you've walked both, you end up getting a certificate to say that you've completed the dual trails. Uh, and again, both of these trails are, are World Heritage trails, so there's definitely the connection through there. So I think overall, you know, this is is one of these sort of things that's probably not high on people's radar. You know, it, it's not as well known as a lot of the overseas trails. You know, the like the Camino, it's probably a better known trail. Uh, some of the US trails or and then European trails and even the Australian trails. But it's it's something that if you're keen to go to Japan and you also are a keen hiker, this is definitely something that's going to be worthwhile doing. Over the next couple of days, so this podcast is being released in uh, mid-May 2020, uh, I'll be releasing a review of the Cicerone Press uh, Kimono Kodo uh, pilgrimage guidebook, which is only the new version's only just been released in the last couple of months, uh, and um, so this is a new book uh, that's going to provide all the up-to-date information. Uh, so if you're listening to this uh, uh, on the day of release, I'll leave it another day or so, and that review will be up online. Okay, we hope you've enjoyed this visit to Japan and the Kumano Kodo Trail, um, and. While we know that you can't actually get out and go hiking now, uh, certainly use this as a bit of a planning uh, for 2021 or and beyond. Yeah, the planes will start flying soon. <laughs> no, or later. I don't know. <laughs> At some point. Okay. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. That's all for me. Bye for now. And bye from me.